So my backstage informed me that you're all on stage. So it's uh, the last session we had today. The pre-recorded presentations have been uh, run and now we're at the point to look for questions from the auditorium, but so far I have not seen questions coming in, so it would be good if you, between you yourselves at <laughs> that stage, have things to highlight. I'm being on us for doing that. I check, I check the the presentation. I like the one of Florin a lot, and the comparison, especially the the last part on the 10 kilovolt uh, device. Would that be a reality in the future? Or? Um, yeah, it's a very good question, uh, Danny. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't believe in 10 kV in a lateral device. I mean, it, it's it's stunning that we've been able, um, and uh, I have to give credit uh, to um, Yuhao and his team at Virginia Tech because they made the device. I was only um, very much in an advisor advisory role there. Um, I have to say, I, I do not believe that a lateral technology for 10 kV is actually feasible. Um, however, still the figure of merit they obtained, it's uh, quite uh, quite amazing. I have to say it's a multi-channel device. Uh, it works on Sapphire. And uh, for the drift lengths they considered, the obtaining 10 kV is quite substantial. But what it shows you is there is a path for higher voltages for gun. And uh, this idea that gun works only at 650 volts or is the maximum voltage you can achieve, uh, it's something that we should revisit uh, as, a, as a community. I believe, for example, that 1.2 kV is well within the reach of, of gallium nitride and lateral technologies. And I think the future will be very bright in these applications. And this multi-channel technology uh, is just one of the possible avenues for this uh, for this kind of uh, development. So yeah, um, so this is this is new. On the other hand, we also see silicon carbide um, evolving uh, within the FinFET technology. And there I was even more involved because uh, it's a concept which came originally from us in Cambridge University. And we really believe that FinFET is a concept which is highly suitable for wide-band gap semiconductor. And in fact, it's suitable both for silicon carbide and gallium nitride. But what it allows in silicon carbide is more than it allows in gun, because silicon carbide suffers from very low mobility in the channel. And by bringing the channel in the middle, by pushing the, uh, the inversion layer in the middle of the pitch, then you take advantage of the bulk mobility rather than the surface mobility. And this allows you to, to, to get significantly better mobility. We estimated there around 15 to 20 times better mobility in silicon carbide. And that allows silicon carbide to go down in voltage to six under volts and below. So it's an interesting fight between the technology, one going up and one allowing a little bit to go down. Um, I believe the future is very bright for both silicon carbide and gallium nitride, to be honest. We the next startup then of silicon carbide. Uh, I like a lot of the FinFET as well. I'm not an expert there, so I just follow and that's yeah. been really, really nice as well. Thank you, gentlemen. That was already a good uh, start of cross talk between you. Uh, also, if I'm right up to date, uh, Transform is doing 1200 volt devices. And uh, so, If we talk about uh, 1200 volt devices, that's a rating which gives us safe uh, uh, operating. Uh, but 
uh, looking into it, the breakdown may be 30% or 40% higher. And that's what I learned uh, over the years is done by the manufacturers to overcome the avalanche, uh, missing av avalanche capability. If I don't know, this is an, another another interesting topic. I mean, I work a lot on, on a gun and looking at the avalanche. I think there is a little bit of misconception in the field regarding the missing avalanche capability of gun. And uh, there is nothing intrinsic to gun that can't do the avalanche, that can't show that gun can have avalanche capability. The truth at the moment is gun is so good um, in in sort of having a very uh, high critical electric field that usually other effects like leakage, um, like a punch through that you have or the vertical leakage in, a, in a lateral gun devices that dominate. So actually the absence of avalanche is because it's hidden. And, you know, people say, okay, but you don't have a P-type, you can't create a hole. It is no, it, it is absolutely possible to create avalanche capability in gun. I think it's just not as desirable as it is in silicon. And the margin that gun offers in terms of um, breakdown compared to other materials is uh, it's extraordinary. Our devices, for example, break at over 1100 volts and yet we rate them at 650 volts. We are wondering our, ourselves why we don't rate them higher because it's, uh, it's a lot of margin that we, we, we offer. So I think gun can have avalanche capability. There is nothing intrinsic to the material itself that doesn't have that. I don't know what other opinions are. I'm happy to listen to. Yeah, I think I agree. The, the lack of an avalanche rating in GAN is not a disadvantage for GAN. Where we're using it is way below the breakdown point. So we don't really need an avalanche rating for that product. I think you summarize it very well. And I, I would, you, you, you brought it to the point, you are well using it quite below the breakdown. And that's, yeah. uh, that's something that had been in technical articles described uh, in my magazine quite a while ago from GAN systems. And they defined a margin there around 30%. Uh, below the breakdown to stay safe. I remember an EP in an ECCE conference in Denver, Colorado, where Asian presenters who had a motor drive uh, operated with scan uh, modules and uh, what they presented was they had so many devices destroyed and we're now starting to investigate but what i saw at that point was in the early days uh, the devices were defined to the breakdown and uh, the inductive uh, load from the motor destroyed uh, the gun devices. That's what what I recognize there. I think Andy, you just yeah. you just got delivery. I saw the big delivery truck uh, back in your window. <laughs> so I think I, I think. Uh, oh, sorry. You might go ahead. Go ahead, please. Uh, so, um, Boro, you, you mentioned that uh, you know this thirty percent margin is um, is because of the lack of avalanche. I, I would say that's yeah. not quite the case. Um, the, this the extra margin um, to to account for the lack of, of avalanche, or to you know as as an alternative solution to uh, providing you know uh, avalanche capability, is a is a convenient side effect. I mean, the reality is. Um, a 600 volt MOSFET can't block more than 600 volt because it will avalanche. A 600 volt GAN device 
can block much more than 600 volts. But the failure mode uh, of time-dependent dielectric breakdown is, it, it's, it's also there for a MOSFET, but you don't ever reach that issue because of avalanche. So if you remove yeah. the avalanche capability, you're left with a time-dependent breakdown. So I would say a 600 volt GAN device may in fact break down at 600 volts at the end of its life if it's been running all the way at the limit because it's, it's a 600 volt GAN device because it can survive 600 volt, not transient, not for one day, but for the, the lifetime. And as a, as a result of designing it that way, it's absolutely capable of, of uh, surviving, what, 900 volts or 1,000 volts for a spike, but I mean, not for 10 years of switching. Okay. It's not like uh, in the world. Uh, I, I presented that on the, our bidirectional gun uh, that is 40 volt rated, let's say. Uh, but then we perform a, a kind of avalanche test and it can sustain repetitive voltage uh, stress up to 60 volt, if I remember well. And then it goes to failure at 96 volts, so two weeks to make that the rated voltage. So I think it, it just behaves in a different way, just that it doesn't yeah. be like silicon. But, it, it but I also I also think this time-dependent dielectric breakdown, I think it's uh, nice that you brought the subject, uh, Edward. But um, the time-dependent dielectric breakdown, you can look at it in two ways. One, as part of a test where you actually um, look at accelerating temperature and so on and accelerating voltage time dependent dielectric breakdown uh, listens to this um, called e-ring equations where you have a double exponential on uh, voltage applied on the dielectric and also double exponential and uh, another exponential on the um, on the temperature however one should look at the field of use where gun is much more efficient than silicon and the result is that actually the average temperature at which GAN operates is much lower than at the average temperature at which a silicon device would operate. And in that respect, time-dependent dielectric breakdown is much less probable because it's exponentially dependent on temperature. And this is an interesting thing is how reliable is GAN? Is one to put them both subject to the same test, but in the field of use, the temperature of GAN is much smaller than the temperature of silicon. So actually it could be that it's much more reliable. And this is where I think the field is moving to the view, well, gun could be more reliable than silicon. It's no longer, you know, you you have hear that also from Navitas, from other people, but I I, I work myself on many, many uh, areas of reliability. And I can say that this is exactly the, the right um, thing, that gun is a more reliable, intrinsically can potentially be more reliable than silicon. And uh, yeah, and by the fact that it can operate at lower temperature, by the fact that it can become intelligent and you can have all kinds of sensing and protection features around, around it. It's a good uh, buzzword. Reliability is important for long, for the industry and for the usage and for the wide acceptance. So I fully agree when you say reliability is better than with silicon, then uh, GAN has a good uh, future for applications. Yeah especially in automotive and industrial applications. Especially automotive. Yeah. We we have to if if it's in the in the uh, motor drive and the uh, important area uh, charging uh, and in this area the failure must go to zero. Otherwise, uh, it will not survive in the automotive. Automotive, I've learned in my young days, is like high rail, but uh, at an economy cost. 
that's uh, what automotive applications require. This, uh, this statement of, uh, of Dan is more reliable than, than silicon. I mean, I live and breathe Dan, so I'm not, not opposed to Gan, but I think this is a bit of a slippery slope to make a statement like that. I mean, it's, I would it's, no it's, more say Gan is I, reliable than I would say that Swiss cheese is reliable. It's a material. I think, I think I, I'm sorry, Edward, but you misinterpreted my statement. I said potentially is more reliable than. Sure, sure. There is, yeah, nothing, there is nothing intrinsically to this semiconductor. There is absolutely nothing intrinsically to this semiconductor that make it work. Uh, that may that it makes it worse than uh, than silicon. However, I can give you several several advantages that potentially you have a better, more reliable material in gun than you have in silicon. So I, I didn't mean to echo what you were saying. I, what you said just reminded me of a statement that I hear quite a lot, which is uh, yeah. a topic in a lot of forums and a lot of questions: Is GAN reliable? And I think that GAN as a material. And just like silicon as a material, has the capability to make a reliable and high quality device. But you have to do the work. And I, I, I'm reluctant to be in, you know, to, to uh, I, I get nervous when people say things like uh, GAN is reliable. Again, I, don't, I didn't mean to, to uh, echo what you were saying. It's just, uh, this is a, um, uh, because all we need is somebody to join the party and make a really unreliable GAN device. It's super easy to make an unreliable GAN device. You just have to be a sloppy engineer. And you can make a really bad GAN device. I think, uh, to be honest, uh, it's not to make a statement, but I think that GAN had to prove much more than what was requested or what is requested today in silicon, because silicon is well accepted. It was a nice presentation from uh, Oliver from Infineon. Uh, previous session where he has this balance at the end where in silicon you only do JEDEC. In GAN you do much more than that. Yeah. Uh, and this is because it's a new material, it has to prove much more than, uh, than what is requested by silicon. And also, also because of the nature and some tests, some tests need to be done differently for GAN. Uh, so in that respect, I think that is more reliable. I think that uh, it has to show that is that because of the last coming to the town. Dennis, let me make a little comment from my uh, history. You see, in the mid 80s, the IGBT was a new device and there were big discussions about reliability and, and, and and uh, the IGBT made it reliable into mainly motor drives and showed great performance worldwide. So any new device or technology has to prove their reliability and when it's proven, then the acceptance is there. Okay, was well, just old man's questions the, coming and, in. And, and, and by oh. the same token, you can also design a bad. You can also design a bad IGBT, right? We know that oh. IGBT prone to latch up, right? You can, you can you can very sense. easily make yeah, an IGBT, DJT. which is terrible. <laughs> you can make a bad device. This is. I just want to pivot the conversation to the device. You know. Oh. I mean, yeah. Of if course. If we map out how to qualify a good device, what makes a device reliable, then each of us as manufacturers can validate and and design in that quality, device by device, not as a, as a technology overall. That's that's the way we win, I think, and convince people. At what? We got the first question in from outside. The question is addressed to Tagore. Would like to hear a comment from Tagore on the reliability of GAN. What's their finding? 
we're talking about that. Yeah, so... Yeah. Mm. Go ahead, Rajay. Okay. Yeah, on the reliability, actually, as uh, I think uh, rightly it was pointed out that uh, as a material, uh, it has it's a completely different from silicon and these things. Uh, but it is a newer uh, material or newer device compared to silicon. So a lot of uh, testings and uh, it has to prove um, on its own, actually. So from Tagore side, we did a lot of uh, reliability on the gate side as well as in the train to source breakdown voltage uh, capability temperature wise several testings we have done it and uh, what we have seen that uh, so far uh, because the uh, tagore uh, is uh, the power gan we started in 2017 so we all uh, five years actually so we did so many testing uh, and this thing so far uh, the reliability uh, it's we got actually uh, uh, we produced our reliability curves also and uh, it's quite uh, good, uh, reliable, and we have seen that the gate voltage wise, actually it is very, very uh, sensitive to gate voltage, uh, than the drain to source voltage. Uh, although we have 650 volts devices, uh, but we uh, conducted test up to 1000 uh, volts and above actually for one minute, or sometimes 850 volts at one minute, so, but still the device is reliable. But uh, since it's a uh, time also comes into picture uh, because we uh, we did not uh, switch the device continuously for many years actually that reliability is uh, only time will uh, tell us that kind of reliability but short time yes the GAN is uh, the, our device is much more reliable than silicon but how long it will survive uh, over a continuously 850 volts if we apply continuous switching uh, for several years uh, Estimation wise, we get quite uh, higher 100 years kind of reliability, but in real uh, life, actually, how the reliability will come, actually, that uh, only over time we'll get to know that. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you. <coughs> now, I, I have a um, comment uh, to what Florian said before. He's yeah. leaving now. So <laughs> um, now, so we, um, I have been working on silica for for more than thirty years, and now, um, like all of you working in gallium nitrate, and we all are convinced that gallium nitrate can be very reliable. And I can buy the argument that gallium nitrate is so much cooler, and many reliability mechanisms are are temperature accelerated, so it has advantages. However, it's full of defects. It's full of traps. That's the main difference with silicon. And we do see some effects of that. So how do we, you know, it's a question to everyone. How do we see that? I mean, it's a material full of traps and still we believe it's more or it can be more reliable than silicon. I fully agree in respect to temperature as uh, a lot of failures in semiconductor applications occur on the elevated temperature, which we know the life as higher as we run a system in temperature as shorter is the lifetime. And there are well uh, studies and schematics to follow up uh, to see the lifetime of uh, systems So that that will help in certain applications uh, for the automotive. And there is the question, how do you see uh, the market uh, where your uh, company will push the products if it's in electro vehicles into traction into solar or wind power, all these power areas are dominant for these switches. Well, I need to make an observation from the other end of the market. 
Um, one of the biggest advantages of GAN devices is the increased efficiency, which eliminates a lot of the cooling requirements. Unfortunately, that doesn't result in a cooler device temperature. What it tends to resolve, resolve itself as are less heat sinks. So what you actually see is, again, tech devices very often running at the same temperature as silicon, but on a smaller device, uh, a smaller power converter. So I, I think there's really um, a good case to be made that in a lot of applications, GAN will run smaller. But in the highest volume applications for GAN today, I think you'll see it's exposed to the same temperatures as silicon. I think that that depends if, um, isn't it? I mean, for consumer, it's true. For industrial, I would say that efficiency becomes even more important than than form factor. If you are thinking about the form factor, yes, you are absolutely right. If you can get rid of the heat sink or shrink the the system running at higher uh, uh, frequency, yes, you are right. But I think in, if you are thinking about efficiency, if you go to a data center, for example, it's all about efficiency. And that is about temperature. So I yeah, think I think it's definitely different in different applications. I, I yeah, agree. exactly. So it depends on the application, but yeah, it's it's true that you can also take the advantage of of uh, you know getting rid of the heat sink or increasing the frequency is another great advantage because then you can shrink the passage and so on. Yeah, another thing that you can get out of GAN is actually. You can operate at higher RDS on compared to a, an equivalent silicon, and that can give you. Of course, that will lead to the same issue that uh, I don't know. It's Alan Smith, I don't know, but he mentioned that the temperature will, for GAN to be competitive, it will have to run or be, you know, operate at the same temperature as silicon, so that people can extract more more advantage out of it. Yes, you're right that efficiency is one aspect, but cost is also there and. Yeah. If you want to get optimum cost, you may have to actually shrink, you know, go to higher RDS on and deliver the same performance. Yeah, I've experienced the same thing. I mean, if, if uh, going from silicon to GAN in the same RDS on and voltage class results in the device operating much cooler, typically people will re-optimize the design because who needs all that extra margin? But that being said, I mean, um, you know the point of uh, of the temperatures being being much lower than what is used for the rating is absolutely true. I mean that in order to be a 600 volt device, it has to be. I mean the the rating is 150 degrees C most likely, and and even if uh, it's never running at 150, it's you know it's rated for that, so it's got to survive that. That's how the the rating is is defined. But most likely, customers are going to be using something like 125 by design at full load, which is maybe 10 percent of the lifetime. So you know, most likely the average temperature is significantly lower than 150, which is really what gives all the, you know, hundreds of volts of margin on the, on the voltage rate. The comment made by Marnix, if I can just comment on something uh, that Marnix said, yes, uh, there's been a lot of improvement in the quality of the epi of gun. I mean, I've been working in this field for more than 10 years, and I've seen, for example, the vertical leakage uh, coming down significantly, uh, not by one order of magnitude, but actually by three, four orders of magnitude. And I can see a lot of progress also in what it was called current collapse. And now we talk about the dynamic Aron and the threshold stability. They all have improved massively to the point that I would say it's less of an issue. And traps, yes, are there, but just understand them. What are traps, in fact? They are just like uh, dopants, which are a bit um, more into the um, into the middle of the bank gap rather than very shallow to make them doping. So, in fact, it's just the way to understand them. It's, it's, there, there is not, nothing wrong with having traps. In fact, uh, when we introduce dopants, when we introduce impurities, they create traps, but just very, very shallow. And here we have a little bit deeper uh, energy level. So we need to understand that. And that, that's all we need to do. And of course, we improve the quality of the material more and more so we can keep them under control. And that's what has been done. I mean, TSMC has an extremely good process today. And there are other foundries which are catching up, actually, with, with a very good process and very good epi. And I mean, I, I welcome the the comments from the foundries. I mean, you yourself, Monique, so you are in charge of a foundry. And I'm sure that this is 
um, this is going to evolve into a better and better material. We already seen immense progress in the last 10 years. Mm. Yeah, I agree, there's a lot of progress, but still compared to silicon, I was just reacting on that, that point that compared yeah. to silicon, it's orders of magnitude uh, above, right? Um, I, I don't think we understand the full picture because still with all these traps, Apparently, we are all capable of making very good devices, reliable devices. So uh, I don't think the physics of that is completely understood uh, already. Uh, but, but you're right, there is a lot of progress and the devices behave as they should. But it is, uh, hey man, it is like 20 years that gun reliability, even with 20 years back, the material was not excellent. There has been studies, several failure mechanisms has been understood and uh, and the, the device are in the market. I mean, ourselves, we have been testing the device quite extensively. We have shipped more than 100 million devices in consumer today. And we are moving into industrial and the future automotive. So I don't see like a dynamic around is something that is well under control. So not only by us, but by others as well. So I think that there are progress and understanding and there is still, I think, a, a, let's say a large margin uh, on the device, especially like what we mentioned before, the breakdown of the device. A 650 volt device is beyond 1100 volt breakdown. That I think all of this together, plus all the tests that has been, also JEDEC has promoted with this uh, new committee, all those tests, I think they just prove and make people improving uh, toward a reliable device. So. Uh, that is why, despite if you take a TAM, it might not look as beautiful as silicon, yet the device is uh, reliable, according to me. Thank you, Dennis. We get a question. Just a second. Well, complementary GAN devices become possible and will there be a market for them so they will appear commercially? Uh, Dennis, what do you think? Uh, complementary no, is I, uh, to no. me... I think it's very difficult for GAN and uh, uh, maybe Florian or others. And uh, I, I believe, I look at it at the time I was at IMEC and uh, I think it's very challenging for GAN to make a, a P-type uh, device, let's say, to have really real CMOS. However, you can successfully make IC with a, uh, Maybe resistor transistor logic is not the best that you can use, but you can make something with it. And then there is a new logic that you can make with the pleasure mode device uh, that is not as good as CMOS, but uh, it can be close there. And then you need to see if it may really make sense to have a CMOS, uh, a complementary gun uh, logic, uh, if that is the question. That's my personal opinion, let's say, on what I've seen in literature. Maybe in the audience there is somebody else that... Uh... Yeah, Navit has does quite a nice job putting functionality uh, to the switch. And uh, I but think not, that's... Uh, yeah, sorry about the interrupt, but I don't think it's a complementary... Uh, no, no, not, not complement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe Florian is more in the form of a professor. I mean, not this not professor, you are a professor. As a, as a, okay, there are studies on the P channel, and uh, MIT is leading some of these studies um, where we showed the two dimensional whole gals uh, working. The mobility, however, of these two dimensional whole gals is much, much lower than two dimensional electron gas. And there are some multi channel, again, multi channel technology to try to compensate for that. A lower mobility in the p-channel. Personally, I see a little bit less appetite for CMOS type 
cells in GAN. And I agree with Dennis that um, we can sort of compensate by using the old uh, style technology using the resistors or a current source in the in the high side of an inverter to make a to make a gate. So you could you could make logic, but you you can't make extensive logic. It's never going to beat uh, silicon in terms of uh, the CMOS or the digital component. But the advantage of integrating something like a driver or integrating some sensing and protection is because they are local and you cut the parasitics between this driver or the sensing and protection and the power device. And there I see a great advantage. But how much you integrate? I think that um, every company has a, a different opinion. My opinion, there is an optimal level of integration. And beyond that, it's actually a disadvantage and you can take much more into silicon. So having a... Uh, an external silicon component rather than integrate everything in done. But integrating some vital function sensing and protection and possibly integrating the driver, there I have uh, sort of, uh, there is a little bit of controversy how much you, you want to do that. Uh, it's, um, it's possible. Thank you. So it exists. P, P channel exists today, and there is a lot of nice work that has been done. The question if it's commercially attractive or not, and I think at the moment it isn't. In the future, we might see some of these P channel uh, devices appearing on the market. My opinion is going to take a long time until we see a P channel again. Even in silicon, P channels are. Uh... The not as good as in China. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. They have lower mobility. But in Ghana, they have very significantly lower mobility. Gentlemen. My backstage, let me know. There are no more questions coming. I thank you very much for contributing in this uh, session and i'm looking forward to see you at one of the upcoming events next year and my plan is to do our white band gap conference in reality again and not digital like today i can wish you merry christmas and a happy new year and uh, enjoy the day and we all wish that peace will happen on our globe and looking forward to better days in general thank you so much and uh, have a nice rest of the day